Kia ora koutou, um, ko Alice Mills toko ingwa, he pukenga matua a hau ki te whare wananga o Tamaki Makaurau. Hello everybody, my name is Alice Mills and I'm a Senior Lecturer in Criminology at the University of Auckland. I'm here to introduce you to Professor John Mohan, who's a Professor of Social Policy at the University of Birmingham and the Director of the Third Sector Research Centre that is based there. He's also a Seeley Fellow at the University um, of Auckland. John is a renowned scholar of the voluntary sector, having worked in this field for um, the past 25 years on a variety of different studies, including that of student volunteering and national service in the US, uh, hospital contribu uh, uh, contr contribution schemes in 20th century Britain, regional and local variations of voluntary action and social capital in the UK, and numerous quantitative studies of voluntary action and voluntary organisations. His most recent book, Continuity and Change in Voluntary Action, written with Rose Lindsay, was described by one reviewer as, a must, as groundbreaking and fascinating, a must read for every student of volunteering and civil society. Here then is John Mowen's public lecture for his Seely Fellowship, Binging Up Society, Politics, Policy and Evidence in the British Voluntary Sector. Thank you. Tanakotu, Tanakotu, Tanakotu Katoa. Ko Antealak te Maunga, Ko Rivertain te Awa, Ko Jordi Toku Iwi, No Newcastle upon Tyne Ahau, Ko John Mohan Toku Ingoa. Greetings, and I'd like to thank first of all the University of Auckland and their Seely Fellowships for inviting me to the university, even in these troubled times, um, which are an opportunity to reflect on the position of voluntary action and its relationships with government in times of crisis and in, t in, and in normal times too. The title I've chosen, He Waka Eke Noa, we are all in this together. That was a phrase used by the British coalition government when they came to power in 2010. What they meant was that all sectors of society needed to come together to reconstruct the social fabric as we emerged from the financial crisis and the Great Recession. As part of this process, David Cameron, the Prime Minister, had begun to articulate his big society philosophy, which reached its peak in the 2010 election campaign when he was making strong claims as to the inherent virtue, value, and impact of voluntary organizations. I want to reflect on what has changed since then and what hasn't, because I think it has much to tell us about how government and voluntary organizations might best work together. I begin with a discussion of the political philosophy underlying the coalition's new agenda and an overview of what happened in terms of policy. Then I look at substantive changes in relation to behaviors and attitudes of the public and to the character of the voluntary sector. Despite the political orientation and pro-voluntarist stance of the government, relationships with the voluntary sector were not always harmonious, and that is important in terms of future partnerships between the two. Nor were economic conditions propitious, Though again, there's an argument that the government made political choices in relation to austerity. I then discuss the recent state of third sector government relationships in the UK before concluding with some remarks on where we are now. And inevitably, these are partially framed by the impending impacts of coronavirus. So what did David Cameron have in mind when he spoke of the big society? He had a vision. He thought that if people were to look back 10 years from the election in 2010, what they would see was that people in Britain didn't just balance the books or get the economy moving again. They would do something really exciting in their society, whether in building affordable housing, tackling youth unemployment, inviting charities to deliver public services, the people in Britain would have worked out the answers to the big social problems. Cameron was doing this because he needed to distinguish his party from its Thatcherite predecessors and soften the right-wing neoliberal edges of the party. He claimed that Britain was a broken society 
as a result of excessive top-down models of state intervention in welfare. He advocated, therefore, a shift from state welfare to social welfare. He claimed that he didn't share the view attributed to Mrs. Thatcher that there was no such thing as society, but he just thought it wasn't the same as the state. He envisaged the voluntary sector as what he termed a kaleidoscope of institutions and organizations competing and combining, developing effective responses to social needs. His policies would combine elements of public sector reform, community empowerment, and philanthropic action. Not only was the voluntary sector ethically and morally superior to the state, it was desirable as it delivered better outcomes. How do we interpret this development? An influential argu argument by the political theorist Alan Ware argued that Mrs. Thatcher's governments had excessively weakened intermediate institutions that stood between citizens and global economic forces. What Ware had in mind here were organizations like trade unions and local government, whose powers had been drastically cut back under the Thatcher governments. Well, Cameron was hardly going to re-empower the trade unions or local government, and the big society was therefore interpreted as his approach to convincing the electorate that there was an alternative which, while accepting the basic free market parameters of Thatcherism, softened its hard edges. But voluntary organizations and communities were never likely to constitute a serious source of countervailing power against the rolling forward of market forces. And there were elements of conservative policy which extended the sphere of markets and competition much further into welfare provision than many in the voluntary sector would have liked. So in terms of policy changes, we might begin by reflecting on what a policy designed to support the voluntary sector might look like. What in practice can governments do to support voluntary action by citizens and to build the capacities of voluntary organizations? The previous Blair and Brown governments had a somewhat top-down approach to the voluntary sector, which was characterized by Jeremy Kendall as hyperactive mainstreaming. In other words, very energetically bringing the voluntary sector right into the heart of government policy through all sorts of mechanisms for consultation and engagement. Labour had to make up for its own previous neglect of the voluntary sector. They did so by promoting policies designed to expand the involvement of the third sector in delivering public services, strengthen the capacity of voluntary organizations to bid for public service contracts, improve relationships between government and the voluntary sector, and support volunteering and citizen engagement. At times, they almost suffocated the sector with consultation. At one point, they had over 40 strategic partners, which doesn't sound terribly strategic. Under Cameron, there was at first a view that the big society was a vaguely specified set of ideas with little substance. By its nature, which is about handing power back to communities, it couldn't be planned from the top down. But that led some, such as the Archbishop of Canterbury, to disparage it as aspirational waffle, a feeling encapsulated by this early cartoon in, in which um, officials are supposedly putting in the detail uh, later of what the big society might look like. But the agenda began to crystallize in various ways around three core themes. The first of these is engagement, trying to get citizens more involved in voluntary action and charitable giving. So, first of all, this because there aren't many levers that, in, that governments can really pull in this space, this meant, aside from rhetorical flourishes about volunteering, it meant things like nudging towards pro-social behavior, trying to give people more information and incentives uh, to engage. Many of these, many proposals featured in the Giving White Paper of 2011. So this is about 
the choice architecture confronting individuals, trying to get them to combine engagement with their everyday lives. Then there's an emphasis on what you might term the usual suspects. It's always young people who need to be socialized into habits of voluntary service. Cameron's National Citizen Service Scheme, in which billions of pounds have been invested so far, is the flagship here, as well as some all-party initiatives around youth social action. In an era in which young people's options seem to be limited to, um, as the sociologist Wolfgang Streich has put it, coping, doping and shopping, something needed to be done to enable them to engage in hoping more purposeful activities, in other words, by behaving in particular prescribed ways, they might um, find their place in society and get on a prosperous career uh, ladder. So lots of rhetoric, rhetorical flourishes about volunteering, some significant commitments um, of money, um, but as we'll see so far, little sign uh, of direct impact. Secondly, public service markets. The intention here was to make it more straightforward for voluntary organizations to take over and run services. So this was embodied through legislation, enabling what became known as the, as the spinning out or the transfer of services from the public sector to nonprofits, the introduction of new models for public services, such as free schools set up and run by uh, parent groups, the attempt to engage citizens, uh, sorry, the engage, in, engage voluntary organizations in, in public services through placing a greater value in public service procurement on the social value of their contributions. For instance, if a project or a provider of services engaged substantial number of volunteers, then the argument went it was worth paying a premium for that. But these contracting processes have taken place in a rigorously competitive environment in which voluntary organizations feel they have lost out. And it's very much a space in which uh, market reforms, particularly in healthcare, have been um, pushed um, very hard in the direction of rigorous competition with much less of a space for voluntary organizations, a protected space for voluntary organizations than perhaps was the case under Labour. Thirdly, there's a strong emphasis on communities, on devolving power down to the lowest possible level. So this is an era of localism and decentralization, giving power back to neighborhoods and communities. We've seen that expressed through many services being transferred back from local authorities to voluntary and community groups. This is particularly noticeable in the case of leisure and library services. But as yet, we don't have systematic evidence, though we believe that there are serious consequences for equity and access. The uneven capacities of communities to take on these challenges are amply on display. Volunteering is heavily stratified socially, so it's clear that some communities can take on these responsibilities and others simply unable to. But of course, this has taken place against severe reductions in local government funding, in which companies feel they have had, com sorry, communities feel they have had little choice but to accept these burdens. So three broad strands of policy around localism, engagement, and public service reform. What have some of the consequences been? Well, what might we have expected, first of all? Growth in charities and social enterprises, increased levels of volunteering and charitable giving, perhaps an expansion of public funding for voluntary organizations as they expanded their role in the welfare state. In practice, what's happened substantively is rather less exciting than that. Rather less, indeed, than some of the expectations that were raised by conservative-leaning think tanks who not long after 2010 were positing that volunteering levels had doubled. This kind of argument does raise the question of what might reasonably expect to have changed over 10 years. And of course, the twin elephants in the room occupied by the coalition 
were the ongoing fallout from the recession of 2007 to 8 and the effects of austerity, or rather, of the political choices around austerity made by the new government. What I've attempted to do in the next slide is to summarize some key trends relating to voluntary organizations, their funding, and voluntary action. And there's six lines on the graph which I'll talk through one by one. They're all standardized around 100, more or less, i.e. as a proportion of a baseline figure around the millennium, just so we can get some purchase on change and between the previous 10 years of labor and the post-2010, um, five years anyway, of the coalition. Anything below 100 shows a worsening situation. So taking them from top to bottom with the purple line, this shows steady real terms growth in total spending by English and Welsh charities over the period. It seems to have nearly doubled and it seems to have doubled uh, fairly steadily without major interruptions. This might look surprising but over the nearly well it's now nearly 20 years for which we have this data there have been changes in the composition of charities. Some very large organizations have come under the charity register. That's the result of what some call manufactured civil society, the creation by government of large new charitable organizations to deliver on specific policy goals, as well as spin-offs of quite substantial chunks of the public sector into charities. So a very big recent example would be the former British Waterways, which maintains the canals network of the UK. That is now the Canal and Rivers Trust with an annual budget of well in excess of £200 million. So that alone is quite a significant addition to the Register of Charities. There's also a number of registration changes which have brought on to the Charity Register some entities that weren't previously uh, visible. They were exempt for various historical uh, reasons. So that at least suggests some fairly steady growth. The next line down, the green one, is employment. That's gone up by 50% over the period of qu in question. And again, it's a fairly steady increase. This suggests that voluntary sector em employment has been somewhat immune to what's happened in the wider economy. The more important point here, though, is that critics have argued about the professionalization of the voluntary sector. If it if an important part of what distinguishes voluntary organizations from the state and from the market is that people give their time on an unpaid basis, then a shift in the balance between volunteers and paid staff is quite significant. And for some, that professionalization and also the prevalence of quite high salaries in some parts of the sector, the inference from that is that voluntary organizations are moving away from their traditional ethos and their origins. The next light blue line is the median income. That's to say rank the income of charities from top to bottom um, and take the one at the midpoint of the distribution. As you can see there, that's grown by around 40% from the 1999, from around 1999 to the mid 2010s. To some extent, there's a survivor bias issue there. Some charities certainly have been shaken out and closed, um, which means that the ones that remain tend uh, to be uh, larger. But again, it's showing fairly steady growth, though in recent, in recent years it's, it's flatlined. Two more negative indicators now. The first one, the dark blue line, is the percentage of organizations that experienced a 25% excess of expenditure over income in any one year. So they're paying out significantly more than they were bringing in. As you can see, um, that starts off reasonably healthy um, in the early 2000s, but over the period and, and around the time of recession, it dips uh, below 100 and it stays there and it's more or less stayed there uh, ever since. So 
there's a sense that the financial position of charities on the whole uh, is worsening. And that's certainly true for the red line, which shows the proportion who've experienced a 25% drop in their income over a three-year period. So if you can see where that red line bottoms out in 2009, that's comparing incomes recorded in 2009 with incomes recorded in 2006. So that's really picking out the effects of, of recession. It's not suggesting that around 40% of organizations were in that position. It's telling us that the proportion of organizations in that situation was substantially greater than it had been three years previously. You can see that it's more or less um, bounced um, back, at least by 2012. And because of the nature of the data involving a three-year time lag, um, it's, the, the line can't be taken beyond that date. So some signs there of the significant economic turbulence in the wider economy. And that, of course, is highly relevant in a time of coronavirus, which I'll come back to at the end of the talk. The last and shortest line in orange concerns government income as a proportion of the income of the voluntary sector as a whole. For context, that's typically been somewhere in the region of 35 to 40 percent. We've only got reliable data on this for around the period since 2008. What it shows, though, is comparing so the first three years in the graph are the last three years of Labour's term in government, where this proportion peaked. It has dropped steadily subsequently. Um, it's down around 10 to 15 percent from where it used to be. And of course, that probably means 1.52 billion pounds, which isn't trivial. But as a share of total funding, the sky hasn't fallen in in a voluntary sector whose collective income is in the 30, 40 billion pound uh, range. What I've not shown there are two indicators of growth and change in the sector. And I haven't put them in because it would complicate the graph and because in fact they've flatlined. The first is the ratio of charities to population. We've had a bit of a tailing off in the numbers of charitable organizations being formed and relative to population, um, the the numbers haven't, which is around three charities per thousand population approximately, hasn't really changed for a very long time. The second is the level of volunteering, although there's more recent signs of reductions, which again, depending, hasn't been measured consistently over this time, but broadly there's consistency. It really has, has, has changed very little with some recessionary blips as exceptions for about as long as we've been measuring it. So the general picture is actually one of considerable stability. The public haven't come forward in greater numbers to volunteer, and instead, the voluntary sector appears to be less voluntary, if by that you mean the extent to which it relies on paid staff. Public funding as a share of the voluntary sector's income has not increased, suggesting that purchasers of public services have not chosen on an increased scale to contract from the voluntary sector. And total resources and median expenditures are generally up. So you might say there's a bit of a glass half full, glass half empty uh, scenario um, here. How we explain some of this involves considering a number of issues around the attitudes of government, their decisions around public spending, uh, their relationships with the sector, but also the attitudes of the public and the wider economic context. The first point I would make is that the policy climate, while rhetorically supportive of vol the voluntary sector, has not been entirely um, supportive. Heavily squeezed by market commissioning processes, the distinctive third sector contribution that third sector organizations make um, 
has not, one might argue, been recognised by commissioners of services and organisations themselves have found it hard to get a toehold in markets. Public service markets have been opened up to any qualified providers, reducing third sector organisations often to the role of bid candy in large private sector consortia. In other words, they give a kind of community orientated gloss to a bid that's actually run by a very large commercial um, concern. Reductions in public expenditure have also meant that aside from key departments like the NHS, all government departments have found budgets significantly reduced in real terms. Local government, which is where you would particularly expect to see partnerships with the voluntary sector, is retrenching to the point where it can really only deliver on a small set of core, set, core statutory obligations such as social care. It's probably also true that with the very large scale statistics I've presented in that graph, we don't see the diversity of experience of all organizations and communities. Public funding for voluntary organizations has been highly concentrated in certain parts of the country, particularly in the later stages of new labor, various redistributive mechanisms existed which have been substantially weakened, if not abandoned, in the last 10 years, which distributed more public funding to projects in those areas. So undoubtedly some subsectors and communities have been particularly affected by the withdrawal of those funds. And there is a concern, sometimes uh, by the voluntary sector, that, the, that small and medium-sized organizations have suffered um, particularly from this. On the other hand, um, when one looks at some very large organizations, some have had and continue to have 90% or more of their funding from government, which has raised questions which have been the focus of targeted criticism about their independence and identity. So the certain public policies um, which have worked, if you like, against the grain of supporting the voluntary sector. There are wider economic circumstances, of course, which influence voluntary action, particularly by individuals. The precariat, the gig economy, zero hours contracts. We all know about these changes in the nature of work. Perhaps less well remarked is that this means that traditional routes into civic engagement and volunteering have been cut off. Traditional workplaces had a role, made a significant contribution in terms of socializing people into engagement through unions and through workplace-based clubs. But the kind of orderly careers, the kind of workplaces in which people would have spent most of their working lives no longer exist for many people. Interestingly, this that point was made by a sociologist, Harold Wilensky, in the late 1950s, already commenting then about the position of men at the bottom end of the labor market who were very largely disengaged from civic participation and voluntary organizations. At the same time, welfare reforms, tighter unemployment benefit rules requiring people to be eligible for work at a drop of a hat, restrictions on the amount of support they get towards their housing, are two examples which generate insecurity and precarity, exacerbating what's going on in the labor market and making it harder for people to engage. We've talked about how resources in the voluntary sector have um, in some senses grown, but the burdens organizations were being expected to bear have undoubtedly increased. The casualties of recession and austerity were visited upon a safety net that looked increasingly frayed, leading to severe pressures on organizations. This did, of course, lead to humane responses such as food banks. Some MPs, however, went too far in praising these as exemplars of the unique qualities and responsiveness of British voluntary action, when many people felt that what they should really have been saying was that such organizations should never have been necessary in a prosperous society. 
like Britain's. Now, not all of these changes can be laid at the door of the of, of the government, um, but none of them uh, help if you're trying to stimulate voluntary action. And looking ahead, coronavirus is bound to shake up our understanding of the nature of workplaces. And again, that may well have ramifications for voluntary action. So what about the public response? How far do they share the aspirations of Cameron and subsequently uh, Theresa May for a shared society? Here I'm drawing on a book, Continuity and Change and Voluntary Action, that I recently wrote uh, with Rose uh, Lindsay. This is largely qualitative material written by people at leisure and therefore often involving them taking considerable time to write down their reflections. Summarizing some of the main themes of this and from survey data on volunteering, inevitably, first of all, the timing of the big society could have been better. It coincided with the country making its way out of recession, first of all, and it came on the back of signals that couldn't have been clearer in 2010 about impending public service, public expenditure reductions. So that led it to be identified as a thinly veiled cover for austerity. Few of the public ever felt they understood the idea. It was never clearly explained, relaunched on more than one occasion without gaining traction, and quietly dropped barely a year after the coalition had come to power. For many people, it symbolized the perception that the conservatives were out of touch. It seemed a throwback to an older vision of voluntarism in which prosperous individuals with time on their hands made philanthropic contributions to those who were less well off. We find our respondents not being opposed in principle or absolutely opposed to the idea of greater voluntary action in a time of crisis for the country, but they wanted a clear rationale for why they were being asked to do more. Examples of their concerns related to clarity about job substitution in public services and concerns about precisely where the line should be drawn between what was the state's responsibility and what it was up to the community to provide. We found negative um, responses from people concerned with the effects of economic change on the level of commitment they and people they knew were able to make to voluntary action. There were concerns about the impact of precarious work on the availability of volunteers. Particularly, we found a very strong sense of exhaustion and an inability to contemplate doing even more. And recently, a, re, a comparison of surveys of people's sense of enjoyment when they carry out different activities by the, um, time use, the Centre for Time Use Research at University College London has found that people at the present time find volunteering far less enjoyable than their counterparts did in the mid-1980s. And that is probably saying something about the pressures they are working under and the pressures organisations are working under. So the public weren't entirely unwilling, but they didn't find the message, message clear or um, persuasive. And as a result, we've seen um, very little in terms of um, an upturn in engagement. We know that recession had significant effects on some aspects of engagement. We think there's some more recent survey data that suggests a downturn, but it's clouded by differences in survey methods. But we think the trend, if it's going anywhere, is slowly uh, downwards. The lack of clarity about the big society message and the context in which it was introduced therefore may account for some of the at best stability in voluntary action. What may not have helped in, in terms of public support was strong public criticisms of voluntary organizations from MPs, sometimes ministers, think tanks, and supportive journalists. The historian Matthew Hilton, written some very significant books on the rise of NGOs in post-war Britain, has characterized this as sticking the boot in to charity. 
To what extent has the government conducted itself as a responsible and supportive partner over the past decade? We can argue about the necessity of its economic policies, but at times it has adopted a confrontational, antagonistic approach. MPs, ministers and others, including even the chair of the Charity Commission, an independent regulator, have been outspoken in their criticisms of the practices of certain charities. These include taking excessive amounts of public money, even in a 10-year period in which that's been a, part, a core part of government policy, paying high salaries to charity executives, though here they are very silent about the high salaries paid to headmasters and teachers of independent schools or about the salaries paid to chief executives of charitable fee-paying hospitals. In fact, the prevalence of high salaries in the charity sector is way lower than uh, either in the public sector and certainly the private sector. And it's, it's a relatively small uh, scale uh, problem confined largely to schools and hospitals. Criticisms of charities for the tolerance of sexual misconduct by staff, for their engagement in unethical and aggressive fundraising techniques. These certainly have more purchase in, in, in reality um, and are wrong. But criticisms of activities such as allegedly political campaigning are more difficult because there's been this rather demeaning phrase used by one um, relevant minister that charities should stick to their knitting. In other words, get on with some nice, cosy domestic task rather than speaking up um, for their clients. So some of these may be defensible um, criticisms. Some of them are, are much more debatable. And at various times, there's, there's been a steady flow of such criticisms. What that's forced organizations into is a somewhat defensive position where they are, and this is a slide for which I should thank my colleague Rob McMillan of Sheffield Hallam University, in which there's this, uh, he's captured this sense of charities being thrown on the defensive having an inward preoccupation with their internal operations, their leadership and governance, rather than the wider social challenges to which they wish to respond. And at times this has seemed like an attempt to neutralize an alternative power base of large scale organized civil society organiza um, organizations such as charities. But there are alternative visions here there's perhaps been a tendency in the third sector for narratives of jeopardy and loss. Having experienced under the Labour government a fairly comfortable decade with lots of rhetorical and financial support, organisations found themselves in very different financial circumstances and faced with a government no longer willing to give them a privileged place at the policy table. So, on the other hand, therefore, expressed particularly through the Civil Society Futures Inquiry at the bottom right um, of this, this, this slide here, and to a lesser extent in the government's civil society strategy, which I think is more accommodating um, of, of voluntary organizations um, than perhaps the last, uh, we've seen it all the time over the last 10 years. There is a view that really the sector's salvation lies in its own hands. It shouldn't be constantly looking to the state for support for whatever kind, and that it might be operating in an unpromising context, but that does not excuse voluntary organizations from a responsibility to control their conduct. In other words, they need to continue and visibly to be so to behave ethically, to command the confidence of the public. So in some senses, the challenges for organizations, one might argue from this slide, are not entirely new. In writing about the resilient third sector, I think Lester Salomon has referred to 
a survival imperative or a distinctiveness imperative. Organizations exist by communicating the ways in which they are distinctive and novel from the state and from other voluntary organizations. So do they seek to retain the ethos and values and founding principles that inspired them and seek an entirely independent existence without public funding or relationships with government? Or do they become co-opted? Do they engage with competitive pressures and adversarial rhetoric from politicians in the belief that without that sort of engagement, things will only get worse? In that vision, organizations should get with the program. The government's job is to make opportunities available. It's up to organizations to embrace change. This often entails operating in a marketized manner, getting used to metrics, and the demonstration of impact. Organizations must therefore constantly prove themselves afresh, not just rest content with their situation and take it for granted that they will receive funding. So yes, these are enduring and ongoing um, dilemmas, but they will play out, I think, in a potentially very different context depending on how the present crisis associated with coronavirus plays out. So I want to finish with some discussion of the ramifications for organizations. The first is about volunteering. In earlier work we've identified a civic core. The bulk, those who do the bulk of voluntary action in the UK are often relatively prosperous individuals in their 60s and 70s and those are of course the group who are now most of all compelled to isolate because of the risks of spreading the disease. That may not last forever. But coronavirus raises new risks. It's in the very nature of volunteering that its greatest benefits are said to derive from face-to-face -face interaction, the kind of warm glow effects of which economists um, speak, um, which are claimed to have all kinds of latent benefits in terms of well-being and health. How this is managed in the new situation, the extent to which things can go online or virtual, very much remains to be seen. We will probably see a challenge for organizations because of the demands for greater informal help within communities, keeping an eye on your vulnerable elderly neighbors rather than giving assistance directly through organizational settings. Recruitment and management practices might well have to change if we can't have large numbers of people assembled in the same place. But at the same time, there's also a lot of evidence from the UK and elsewhere that a strong organizational presence um, is essential as an infrastructure for providing opportunities for people to engage. And I think we'll see that in the present case. Community centers, voluntary organizations of all kinds will be the basis around which action continues to be um, mobilized, even if the precise form of that mobilization begins to look different. Funding. At this time of year, back in the UK, one could hardly fail to be aware of the extent to which fundraising really steps up a gear from the spring onwards through events that bring people together um, in public spaces, in the open air, in very large numbers. School PTAs, for example, village fates, all those kind of things running through the harvest festivals um, at the end of the year. For now, they are going to have to stop. They often bring the main annual source of income for many local organizations. Redail operations, the significance of these to, to charities can't be um, underestimated. Some organizations are technically classified by the Office for National Statistics as market producers because so much of what they do looks like retail operations. These rely on the donations of goods and their sale uh, in shops. Again, for the foreseeable future, these will dry up. Organizations that relies on fees for services, particularly in the arts and cultural field, uh, likewise. And these will all have knock-on effects. Um, many voluntary organizations 
pass money on to other voluntary organizations through using their facilities, through performing in uh, concerts and plays in church halls um, and so forth in, in community centers. So there are knock-on effects which will raise those indicators of financial vulnerability of which I spoke to new and unprecedented levels. There'll be major cash flow problems despite some public perceptions fanned sometimes by government, two thirds of charities receive nothing from the state. Assets for those that have them will drop in value. Legacies will be likely to shrink. There'll be a time lag on some of this, but this will um, come through. And the geographical impacts will be differentiated. Place, places occupied by large numbers of people in secure occupations and with a relatively young age structure will find they're relatively insulated, but communities which have high proportions of people in insecure jobs uh, will not. And I mentioned that we're gonna have to think about the nature of workplaces and the interactions between different forms of work. Um, volunteering is just one form of work on a continuum uh, from unpaid domestic care in domestic settings through to uh, full-time paid work in, in workplaces. Some of these boundaries are going to shift. How they will shift will vary massively between um, communities. In the discussion of coronavirus so far, for example, the top-heavy age structure of many Italian settlements has featured strongly in accounts of the burden of, of the disease. That's just one illustration, but we have similar um, variations um, in the UK in terms of concentrations of people aged over 70 uh, in the population. And the whole nature of work and how that uh, may change uh, and that is a basis for uh, engagement. That's going to be up for grabs too. So to conclude, what can governments do to support voluntary action and what might this look like in um, the future? I think what we learned from the last 10 years um, is that there's some tasks that perhaps government have to manage in relation, first of all, to public service markets and core infrastructural support for the voluntary sector. There are things where government, action, government support is absolutely essential because there's a problem of market failure. And one of these is the infrastructure of the voluntary sector, the councils for voluntary service or whatever they may be called in different parts of the world through which people are networked and placed in contact with voluntary organizations this is not cost free you don't just get some automatic match between donors volunteers and organizations um, and that needs to be a government function in some shape or form governments might wish to engage organizations in public service markets but the terms on which this takes place do matter. And I think um, there's been a very marketized version of that in the UK, in the U which perhaps needs to be reconsidered. But I think there are things that might be done more generally, um, which where the lessons of the last 10 years are clear. This is a challenge for governments, but managing the economy in a stable fashion. There is evidence that suggests the way recession was managed in Britain in the early 80s, where there was a huge shakeout of labor, has long-term civic penalties for individuals who lost their jobs through redundancy. There is evidence from the 2007-8 recession of a reduction in commitment by volunteers. Now, there are trade-offs there, uh, but if we want a stable, high level of volunteering, to paraphrase William Beveridge from the 1940s and his views on employment, we need a stable high level of employment. Governments need to step back from the temptations they seem to be unable to resist to get organizations to toe the line. That was a strong and disappointing feature of the post-2010 governments um, perhaps worse after 2015, governments need to recognize the value of independent voluntary action um, and develop a much less antagonistic relationship 
um, with voluntary organizations. It would help if both sides acknowledged a clear sense of boundaries, what voluntary organizations, what charities can and can't do. And perhaps some modesty about claims as well. The Cameron government might have exaggerated the value and virtues of voluntary action, but many elements in the sector were very keen to play along with it. We need an accommodation which I think recognizes a settled sense of the statutory voluntary sector boundary and a retreat from some of the confrontational rhetoric and overblown claims that characterize negotiation of this relationship. Hey Waka Eke Noah, we really are all in this together now and we need to have a shared and settled view of where the government voluntary sector relationship will will go in the future. Thank you.